Even in a utopia, someone needs to clean up the mess. And that's where I come in. We're returning to Rapture with the DLC, but it's a whole new Rapture. It's really not, you know, it's not the same dark and claustrophobic space as it was in Bio One, and that was sort of. Um, a really fun process to be a part of in that we're reimagining Rapture but we're giving it a whole new character. It's got this luxurious gleaming finish to everything. You know, it's alive with people and lighting. So it's something that the player will recognize but it's kind of a whole new spin on it. We went through a lot of iterations early on in the DLC, you know. Um, and I think at, at one point we had a meeting with Ken and he just said, you know, one word and that was basically alive and then you know, we just made it feel alive, basically. You know, very bright champagne lighting, um, people everywhere, you know, basically what you probably imagined Rapture to be, you know, before the downfall. During Burial at Sea, you know, we wanted to take the opportunity to set it in Rapture, and that meant recreating Rapture in the, en in the engine that we built for Bioshock Infinite. Um, which means, you know, all new assets. It was pretty much built from scratch, from the ground up. Definitely like to challenge ourselves. I mean, for DLC, we, we pretty much made a whole new game, um, you know, and I, I think that's something that, you know, we wouldn't just, uh, you know, take assets from Bio One and just rebuild, you know, Rapture. That's just not our style, you know. Like, we, we took on the challenge to really kind of make it something different and new, you know, something you've never experienced before. Almost every art piece is, is brand new, you know, made by our modeling department, yeah. and, and it's a different lighting scheme. I mean, you know, we, we referenced Bio One for sure. I mean, you know, we all went home and played it again, you know, that kind of thing. Um, but um, it's definitely a unique experience from, from Bio One. A lot of those spaces in Bio One, once you turn the lights on, you know, you realize that there's a lot of questions left unanswered. Um, you know, when we're, when we're creating the spaces in Rapture with, with the lights on, with that, you know, alive sense of vibrancy to everything, um, we had to fill in a lot more blanks. And so we had to build a real believable city uh, with believable hierarchies and spaces. Columbia Up in the Sky and Rapture in the Sea both had these massive cityscape vistas that we want to show off in the distance, communicating the scale of the city. So both of them have the opportunities to show that, like, that expanse and that grandeur. Um, they ended up being, oh, I think, a lot more similar than, than any of us would have guessed, the process of building them. Um, developing an architecture for Rapture was completely different. You know, that came from a totally different source. We were looking at Art Deco sources and Streamline Modern sources. Um, totally different look from Columbia, of course. But in the end, the process of concepting that stuff and building it out and creating those spaces ended up being pretty similar. In Colombia, we're trying to make really the most quintessential American city that you can imagine from the year 1912. And that, is, that was like the, at the heart of the statement we were trying to make visually in Colombia was this hyper-American, like American to the point of almost being a parody of itself. Um, and then also to set the whole thing floating up in the sky. Perfectly American, 4th of July summer day was the, uh, the goal. We had to make that believable for one. Um, that was definitely a challenge. I mean, how do you sell a city floating in the sky? You know, that was a big question that, um, you know, we, we dealt with on a regular basis. Doing tons of period research, um, always going back to the source, seeing what, what did American cities actually look like back in that time period, trying to pull in iconic elements from those that the player would recognize and make an association with. Research the, you know, the World's Fair. Um, that was a big uh, reference point for us. Uh, the book, The Devil in the White City, was a big inspiration to us as well. Anything that you hear an NPC say in dialogue or you know stuff that you're reading or listening to an audio log of should be mirrored in the environment at the same time visually so that all of those paths of inputs we have to the player are leading towards the same goal, story goal. Shall we tell him when we'll be returning? That change it. It might give him some comfort. Well, at least that's something we can agree on. Hey! Somebody meeting me here? I'd certainly hope so. It does seem like a dreadful place to be stranded. Ken always tells us that, you know, the visuals are like the T1 connection to the player, and the audio is, you know, a much lower fidelity connection. So if the player sees a story communicated to them, uh, you know, in their face, it's going to have a much stronger impact than if the visuals are kind of blah, but they just hear something interesting over an audio log. 
we concept, direct, and build both types of spaces, combat spaces and more narrative spaces. Sometimes they blur and overlap and you'll have a space that's used for both. But that pacing of, of the player going through a calm, more narrative-driven space and then going into a big, you know, combat-heavy kind of space is something we have to pay a lot of attention to and make sure that they support each other and that you don't get a feeling like the spaces are fighting with each other on purpose. And focal points, you know, we have to make sure that we sell the player a narrative-bound story and then not mix it up with combat, you know, mixed in there. It's a big thing to get pacing down right as well. It's something that we spend a lot of time with in terms of, you know, showing statement after statement, telling a story from, you know, one beat to the next. Um, is a big challenge, but um, it's something we definitely strive to get right. We try not to take control of the player's camera ever. We try to let the player be in this immersive environment and look wherever they want to look and, you know, really feel a part of it, not like we're holding their hand through an experience. And so to that end, it can be really difficult for us to make sure that the player focuses on what we need them to see when they're surrounded by all this interesting stuff all over the screen. So we go to great lengths to really cut down on the amount of confusing statements and make sure that they're able to focus on one specific iconic story element that we need them to absorb. Traveling through these massive, you know, cityscape streets and stuff like that was, was very difficult to get right and then, you know, uh, basically tunneling you into you know darker interiors to get that kind of moody feel um, it proposed like a really nice contrast we always have a lot more control over interior environments smaller spaces that you know we can control the lighting completely sometimes the interior doesn't even you know fit within the building exterior but it's all you know we we're able to control that whole experience from the start to the finish exterior environment has to be a lot more of a big picture time of day you know lighting is a lot more kind of out of your control it's usually more difficult to get a, a focus when you know, you're in this giant arena, basically. Um, whereas interior spaces are, are much more tighter, you know, you can kind of funnel the player. Um, so that was, was definitely challenging. Who are you? My name is DeWitt. I'm a friend. I come to get you out get of here. Get away! <gasps> no! <sighs> are you real? have a character that you're with 100% of the time and because she's human she has to be represented at every step of the way in such a way that doesn't destroy your belief in that she is actually a human. Um, you know, everybody is an expert at human behavior and the minute somebody does something strange, especially a character that you're supposed to have emotions for, it can destroy that uh, illusion so you have to be very careful about what you're presenting to the player at any given time. Ken worked with uh, Courtney Draper, the voice actress. A lot of times you can really feel the read, what were Courtney and Ken doing in the uh, audio booth when this recording is happening, what's the energy and where are we going with this. You get a sense of where the scene's going before you really have to dig down into what the animation's going to be. Uh, we also had actress Heather Gordon who is the motion capture actress that would act along to Courtney's pre-recorded VO. So you get a lot of good energy from that. One of the things you, you think about is um, how often do we need to take the player's attention away from what they want to be doing to tell a story with Elizabeth. I mean, even early on when we talked about Elizabeth possibly being mute, we realized that although from an animation aspect, that's a great challenge, right? Like the animators would love to be able to work on a character that spoke with their body and and try to get your attention, but to tell a story with someone who can't talk, like anytime they want to say something, your whole entire experience is her telling you something. You can't be walking down the street and looking at a building, or you can't be looting something and have her talking to you. You have to be looking at her. Challenges we had on displaying Rapture are the same challenges we had with Elizabeth. We had to think about what femme fatale Elizabeth was going to do in certain situations and how she's going to behave um, through certain narrative scenes. We all steeped ourselves in references of the time, Chinatown, uh, Double Indemnity, even down to Courtney and Heather understanding what they're trying to do with femme fatale Elizabeth. I think everybody kind of, it, it, it kind of clicked. Uh, you know, all the pieces came together and I think you know, if you look at the first introductory scene that we did, you can see all those pieces coming together when the, when the player meets Elizabeth again. To create an experience that felt like Rapture Before the Fall in terms of the story we were trying to tell, in terms of the environments we were building, but also there's the gameplay aspect of it. We, you know, Bioshock Infinite has, you know, high mobility, sort of fast-paced core action loop, and we wanted to basically take you back to, to the types of encounters that you would have found on, on the original Bioshock, which are slower paced 
and you know they're they're more player initiated where players can you know plan out what they want to do before they actually execute we took the gameplay systems and we reworked them and rebalanced them to focus more on resource management and stealth you know the, the gameplay encounters are a callback to the experience that you had in the original Bioshock but using the systems that we built for Bioshock Infinite uh, we kind of had to theme the skylines, you know, we wanted it as a gameplay element. Um, and so we came up with the idea of making it uh, Numo lines, basically, where, you know, uh, you know, mail traffic and, and whatnot would travel through Rapture. And that's kind of how we themed it. Um, and it seemed to fit pretty well in the, the Bioshock universe. I mean, as with everything else that we integrated, you know, it, it was a tool that, that, you know, we built for Bioshock Infinite and that we wanted it to play a role here in Rapture. We wanted to integrate it in a way that, that felt natural within the environment and you know but still offered that layer of, of tactical choice for players when you know they were approaching an encounter which have a very different feel this time this time around you know you can hear enemies off in the distance and you know when you enter a space you know the enemies are just doing what they're doing in the world so you have a, a chance to plan your attack before you engage. Tools like the, the trap functionality of plasmids, now they play a more important role because of, of the fact that you can, you can plan before you, you execute. You know, I don't want to spoil the story for the fans, but there, there's, there's a reason why this environment is, is separate. Why the characters that are trapped in that environment um, are there, and you know, there are things that, that have happened to them. I'm not going to spoil anything, but there's some a couple fun dialogue items about constants and variables, variables between different universes. What we wanted to do was justice by the, what Rapture was like, what the vision of Rapture before the fall would be like, and representing that in a way that, that fans, I think, can be really excited about. Where are you taking me? When's the last time you saw Sally? What? She was taken from you, wasn't she? How do you know this? She was taken, down at Surprise. You were playing the tables and... She disappeared. And? A cop friend of mine, Sullivan, says they found her floating in the docks. You see the body? Look. Did you see the body? This world values children, not childhood. There's a profit to be made and men who make it. I'm taking you to one of them.